it's difficult to know what to say. It's difficult to know what to say sometimes. I mean, that's definitely how I felt when I was kind of staring at the blank screen, trying to decide what to, what to say here today, trying to think of some ideas what to write, what to say here today. Um, I imagine many of you might have experienced that, whether that's struggling with uh, what to say in a presentation, maybe struggling with uh, how to write a particularly tricky email. Uh, it can be really challenging. But in the last year, there are a lot of new tools that can help with this, a lot of new tools that, that can help with the, the writer's block. Um, and that's largely due to advances in what's known as generative AI. So broadly speaking, generative AI is a category of AI or artificial intelligence that can be used to create new content. You might have heard of ChatGPT. Uh, many of you might have used ChatGPT or played around with ChatGPT, maybe to draft an email, write a presentation, maybe to chat somebody up online. Apparently, that's what people are doing these days, at least so I'm told. Uh, but yeah, ChatGPT is one example of generative AI. Other forms of generative AI can be used to create images. Uh, that might be illustrations or in the style of paintings or drawings. It might also be photorealistic images or pretty much anything you could possibly want and some things you never knew you wanted, like space traveling gerbil, why not? Um, or the Pope in a Balenciaga puffer jacket. <laughs> <laughs> These are AI-generated images. Um, but a, a generative AI can also be used to create videos, fake videos, and also synthetic or cloned voices that can very realistically replicate or imitate real individual human voices. So when I was staring at the blank screen, struggling with what I might say here today, I could have used generative AI. I could have used ChatGPT, maybe to give me a bit of a starter, maybe to give me a hilarious more realistically and moderately amusing opening one-liner. Uh, I could have done that. But actually, what I want to talk to you today is about today is some of the reasons why I didn't use generative AI, why I didn't use ChatGPT, and some of the reasons why you might also want to think twice before experimenting with, with generative AI or using generative AI to, to help you with these challenges. First of all, generative AI, these are not altogether new technologies. They've been developing for a number of years. Uh, but it's really been in the last year that we've seen something of a kind of frenzy of excitement around how generative AI might be used, also how it might be misused. That's partly because these technologies are now accessible to pretty much anybody with internet access, and you don't need to have an understanding of the technical inner workings of how these systems work. We've also seen heightened public interest because these technologies have now reached the point where it's becoming increasingly difficult to reliably detect what's real and what's been AI generated. And that poses real risks for how these could be misused and risks for the future of democracy. Um, it's not just that we might you know, see something fake and be convinced that it's real. Increasingly, we might see something that's real and think, nah, probably fake. And especially if we see something which challenges our political or ideological view of the world. And that's fundamentally a challenge for democracy. You know, a, democ a healthy functioning democracy needs us to have access to reliable, trustworthy information about the world. But okay, you might be thinking, well, you know, so long as you're not using generative AI to create politically sensitive fake content or to spread disinformation online, so long as you're not using it to try and topple a government, uh, maybe it's okay. You know, if you're using generative AI to redraft your CV, reformat your CV, or to craft witty, charming uh, responses to your online, your online dating match, maybe it's pretty harmless, right? Right? Well, maybe not. Uh, and to explain why, we need to have a look at what's going on in the background, how these systems actually work, and what's going on in the background when you interact with generative AI models. Now, I realize this is a bit where people may start to kind of zone out, start to get worried that's going to be a technical, complicated explanation coming. Don't worry, it's going to be okay. We will get through this next bit together. Because actually, you know, it's not actually that complicated. It's not actually that, that complex. There are a lot of big tech companies who would like you to believe that AI is so complex, so technical, that it's beyond what everyday normal people could understand. But that's nonsense. <laughs> big tech would like you to believe that, mostly because when you think that you're not going to be able to understand something, you're much less likely to ask questions about it or to seek explanations about it. Particularly awkward questions like, how safe is it? Or how can we hold big tech companies accountable for the decisions they're making? Right? Important questions. So often AI is presented as something mysterious, even as something magical, something we can interact with, we can use, but never really understand how it's producing what it's producing or why it's doing what it's doing. Do you know what that reminds me of? The Wizard of Oz. 
<laughs> in the Wizard of Oz, Dorothy and her friends, they thought that they were speaking to a, a magical, mysterious source of wisdom, an all-knowing source of wisdom. But actually, it turned out, it was just one man behind a green curtain tinkering on a computer. And it's the same with generative AI. Right? If we pull back the curtain of generative AI, okay, we won't find just one man tinkering on one computer, but we'll find many, many people tinkering on lots of computers. And we would find that generative AI isn't so magical or mysterious after all. What we'd actually find is the corporate machinery that makes this all possible, the business decisions and design choices that go into how generative AI is developed and deployed. So let's do that. Let's pull back the curtain on generative AI and see what lies behind. Now, the first thing that all generative AI models have in common is that they're all based on huge data sets, huge data sets that they're trained on. Um, and so what they produce is always a reflection that they've been trained on. And from that data, they find patterns and they classify the information in those data sets to make predictions about what would be an appropriate or a convincing response to any given prompt. But those data sets often present a fairly skewed view of society. Right? They're trained on data sets um, scraped from the internet. And the society as it's represented on the internet is certainly not a society that I would want to live in. Now, it prioritizes or it's dominated by privileged points of view. Uh, minoritized communities tend to be underrepresented or misrepresented through stereotypes. When we look at image generators, image generators are trained on data sets of images scraped from the internet. Those images contain a disproportionately high amount of sexual sexualized content, sexualized representations of women, of women <laughs> to such an extent that when OpenAI removes sexualized content from the training data sets, it significantly reduced the likelihood of women being represented in any images at all. So how these, what, what, what these generative AI models show, what their outputs are, is always a reflection of the data they're trained on. And biases and emissions in those training data sets will be perpetuated in the outputs. So ask ChatGPT to describe a doctor or a lawyer or a CEO. It's probably going to do that using he and him pronouns. Ask an image generator to give you a picture of a lawyer. It's probably going to show you a white man. And those are just the most obvious biases. There are many more subtle or perhaps surprising forms of biases that can come out as these systems are used. That can lead to harmful or inappropriate outputs. But these systems, these models, they don't learn these things by themselves. They're not magical, and despite the name, they're not intelligent. They're programmed by people. They learn to make classifications within, these, within the models, within the data sets, because those data sets have been classified and labeled by people. So there are lots of people involved in these processes, lots of people involved in training these systems to, 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 to how they work, how they work. But there are lots of, also many, many people who are involved who didn't choose to be. The writers, artists, creative professionals whose work has gone into training those data sets, who weren't asked for their permission, who aren't credited, who aren't compensated when those models use their data to produce outputs, even when those outputs are used for profit, and even when those outputs are used to replicate or imitate their own particular styles or artworks. And then there are other people whose role it is to make these systems safe, or at least a bit safer. So how does ChatGPT know not to, to produce violent, derogatory, or offensive statements? How do image generators know not to produce images of violent assault or sexual assault? They don't know these things intuitively. They don't know what's right or wrong. They have to be trained. And that training can really be brutal. It's not the glamorous, high-paid work of Silicon Valley tech bros. I mean, can you imagine them spending days, weeks, months, trawling through reams and reams of text describing sexual abuse, violent assaults, bestiality, even child sexual abuse, and meticulously labeling those data sets to train the models to, to recognize those types of text. No, this grueling and in reality quite traumatizing work is outsourced and offshored. So in the case of ChatGPT, Time magazine reported that this work was outsourced to Kenyan laborers who were paid less than $2 an hour and often paid a heavy price with impacts on their mental health and well-being. This is an important part of how these systems are developed. But with all the buzz around generative AI, why don't we hear more about that? And another thing we don't hear enough about is the environmental impacts of generative AI. Now, it's hard to give definitive figures for this, in part because there's very little transparency from big tech companies around this. But it's been estimated uh, that GPT-3, now GPT-3 was the large language model that came before ChatGPT. So it's not the biggest, it's not the most recent. But in this estimate, it was estimated that the training phase of GPT-3 had carbon emissions equivalent of driving a car to the moon and back. 
which I find it hard to get my head around. Like, it's massive. And that's just a training phase. That doesn't take account of the ongoing operation and running of these models. But it's not just carbon emissions. These models also use huge amounts of, of water to cool the servers that are needed for their operation. So it's been estimated that every time, every typical uh, user interaction with ChatGPT uses the equivalent of a 500 milliliter bottle of water. And this starts to add up. But it doesn't have to be like this. Okay? Generative AI is not the only type of AI. You know, there are some phenomenal claims made by big tech companies about how generative AI could be used to tackle big challenges like addressing climate change. But then you have to ask, you know, is developing highly polluting, water-guzzling models really the best way to address climate change? I'm not actually against AI. I actually think AI can be quite brilliant. Um, I'm an ethics fellow at the Alan Turing Institute. And the Alan Turing Institute is the UK's national institute for AI and data science. And the reason I work in this area is because I do believe that AI can do amazing things. I do believe that AI can help us to address big challenges facing the world. But it can only do that if it's designed and developed responsibly. And to do that, we need a different conversation about AI, one that is not swept up by the hype and sensationalism, one that's not been led by big tech companies, and one that recognizes that when it comes to AI models, bigger is not necessarily better. So we need a different kind of conversation about AI. We need a conversation about AI that starts with the problems we want to solve and shapes AI or seeks to design and develop AI systems based on the needs and interests of society. Now, if I'd used ChatGPT Chat to write this talk today, it probably would have given me a nice, neat closing statement, maybe a heartwarming note of thanks or a, a light-hearted quip to leave you on. But instead, I'll leave you with the thought. If I had done that, would it have been worth it? Thank you. <laughs>